Amen. So, we carry on then this morning to part three of Peter. And I love this one because it's just, it, it, you just see the love of God so manifest in this uh, particular sermon. The love of Jesus, the grace of God. If there's one problem non-believers have with the church, it's judgmental attitudes of the church. If you ask a lot of people why they won't go to church, they say, well, I'm not good enough. Because immediately they're feeling judged. But Jesus hung around with the unbelievers and the sinners. Amen? And in his presence, they didn't feel guilty. They were set free. Amen? So the word of God is wonderful. Last week we saw Peter the Reed. We saw his character. Uh, we saw his presumptuousness, impulsiveness. He was a reactionary. He reacted to what was going on around him. Uh, it was full of contradictions. One minute he was super spiritual, getting that revelation. The next minute he was a complete flesh bag, in the flesh, nothing spiritual about him. And often we can see ourselves in the life of Peter. One minute he was self-sacrificing, the next minute he was self-seeking. Peter denied Jesus three times. We also see a glimpse last week of Peter the Rock, where he was reliable, where we did have insight, where he was uh, faithful to the Lord. So you just get this two, it's just not two types of person really, it's just his personality. That's just who Peter was. He was that sort of person. And you know, as you walk with the Lord, we, we, you naturally change. You do, I tell you. Sometimes you can burn yourself out trying to change. You really try religiously to change. Read your word, worship God, take your eyes off of trying to change, and the closer you get to the Lord, you will naturally change. You will. You will. It's not a married couple. They're two very different people when they start off their journey in life. But as you kind of move further down that, down that journey, you spend more time together, you kind of merge, you become one, you become very similar, okay? And it's the same with the Lord. So we see all these different things about Peter. The times that he had spiritual insight, when the rest of the disciples didn't, Peter did. When Jesus said, but what about you? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter was the one who answered and said, you are the Messiah, son of the living God. And he had that spot on uh, discernment. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jacob, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Don't you love it when God just reveals something to you? You, you know, you read your word and you look and you go, well, I, I never saw that before. How many times have I read that? And yet I never saw it. And God just shows you a little revelation. I got a revelation a couple of weeks ago. I was reading my word. And I, I, I've studied a lot on the life of David. Okay? A lot, a lot, a lot. And I was reading my Bible and I didn't realise after one of the battles that took place, I think it was with the Midianites, David to shame his enemy, had the backside cut out of all of their clothes so that their bum was exposed. So she really, I mean, that's David. I mean, he's a naughty trickster, you know. But to humiliate his enemy, he had the backside cut out of all their clothes. And now, right, you might say, well, that's not a big spiritual revelation. Yeah, but it's a revelation to me, okay? And I kind of like that. I can imagine myself doing that. Be careful when you stand up this morning. That's what I'm saying. So this revelation, for this was not given to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Hallelujah. Ask God to reveal the word of God to you. Ask the Lord to speak to you. And if you're asking him to speak to you, be willing to listen. Okay? And that's, you know, a lot of husbands and wives, a lot of wives moan, my husband don't listen to me. He don't listen to me. That's because when you say to him, listen to me, he's worried you're going to nag him or tell him off for something because you know he's five years old, nearly six. 
okay, in reality. But we have to listen, we have to take time. Listening to people is so important. And I've learned to listening to people gives them value. You value somebody when you shut up and just listen to them. <coughs> just listen. You know, Marvin's learning, we're giving Caleb driving lessons at the moment. He's got me as his instructor. We're doing pretty well. But his mum has never, never had a proper driving lesson, got a provisional license, never done. Sitting in the back, also giving him instructions as well at the same time. <laughs> and like, we're going down the road, and she's like saying, Oh, yeah, change gear, Caleb. Oh, well done, Caleb. And uh, I'm sitting in the front. She's never, she hasn't even got a license. And I'm looking back. Shut up! Stop talking! Stop doing it! And Caleb, he wants to learn to drive one hand on the wheel and he would also like to have Tyler the Creator, for those of you who know that, he's blaring out of his sound system at the same time. I'm saying, Caleb, you've got to turn it off. Why? Well, when you have proper lessons with an instructor, they will not let you have music blaring out the car. So, Communication is important in any form of relationship. Jesus challenged them again, the disciples. He said, you do not want to leave with two, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Ah, oh, there's a, I mean, how much did Peter grasp? How much did he know? That revelation, nobody, they weren't getting it. The religious world wasn't getting it. People didn't understand, but yet Peter, in those words, he says to him, Lord, and again, he, he starts off saying, uh, teacher, rabbi, and he, he ends up saying, Lord. So he's saying, Lord, he addresses him as to who he really is, Lord. To whom should we go? He knows there's no other hope. And sometimes if you got fed up with God, it's all right, if I'm watching, you can say. If you got fed up with God, you're cheesed off with him about something, something not, not going right, or you're not getting healing, or not getting the breakthrough, or you're just fed up. You know, you're fed up with the Lord. And sometimes people get cheesed off in life with different things. But, Peter says, to whom can we go? And I don't know if you've done that, I've, I've been disappointed before and I've wanted to walk away before, and then, but then you're left with the realisation, the situation, but to whom do I go? There is no God but you. There's only you, I can't get what goes left or right. There, there is no one but God. And so you, we're like children and we eventually, after having a tantrum, we kind of come back because we know to whom can we go? I can remember as a child, me and my sister decided to run away. And we took one tin opener and a can of beans. I don't know how long we were going for, but that's what we took. We took a tin opener and a can of beans, we went up the back alleyway, we said, that's it, we're running away. After about an hour later, we realised we weren't going to get very far, we went back home again. We never told my mum and dad, though. But to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter knew so much in this, ah, it's amazing. The revelation that he was, he was realising who Jesus was and what Jesus was about and you have the words of eternal life, so whom can we go? We have come to believe and know. That was the conversation we had this week, me and Ma. You come to believe and know. I, the Lord challenged me about two years ago and he said this to me, it's very challenging, he said to me, what do you believe about what you know? Because you know a lot of stuff about me, Christianity, and all of this, and you know a lot of stuff, but what do you believe about what you know? That's a challenge. That is a challenge. I'm telling you, if you can challenge yourself. And I, I was challenged in my heart, but yeah, what do I be? Am I living as if I really believe that, or am I living as if I know it? There's a difference between knowing and believing. What do you believe about what you know? Amen? So Peter was vocal, he showed uh, 
stupidity at times, and then he showed brilliant leadership qualities at times. There were times when he spoke to Jesus on behalf of the disciples. There were times when he spoke to Jesus and he shouldn't have done. Remember last week he said about reading a room, knowing when not to say anything. You know, you get people that just can't help it. They're at a team meeting at work and they feel obligated. They need to say something. They need to be heard just, to, just for the sake of it. And, that, and probably what they're going to say is irrelevant. But they just need to be heard. And sometimes you've got to learn to read a room. We said about Caleb, they just walk into a room, doesn't matter what it is, sorry, son. Doesn't matter when me and mum are talking, doesn't matter what's happened or anything, anything. They just walk in, present to oh, by the way, blah, 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 blah. Well, Caleb, not now, now's not the time. You know, and you get some people who can't read a room, the atmosphere. And sometimes that was Peter. Peter couldn't read a room. It would just go in. We saw Peter as the rock, sturdy as well. Despite Peter's errors, faults, sins, his denial of Christ, Peter was teachable. And that's the grace. You know, I love, I don't mind people being anywhere, I don't mind people getting things wrong in life, it doesn't bother me, it's just like, but are you teachable? Are you teachable? I've had lots of people ask me to mentor them, and I tell you what, it's really frustrating if they're not teachable. They want to be taught, they come to you and say, teach me, and the minute you begin to teach them, and you get close to some of their own flaws or theological situations which aren't quite right or whatever, suddenly they don't want to be taught anymore. They're no longer teachable, okay? But Peter was teachable. And that's the lovely thing with Peter. And despite the shape he was in, when Jesus prophesied and said, upon this rock I will build my church, he was a mess. Peter himself was a mess. And the disciples must have been thinking, well, we're on a hiding to nowhere. So we're just not going to succeed. We're like the arsenal of the ancient world, you know, because we're not succeeding either. But Peter was teachable. Last week we saw the denial, how Peter denied Christ, John 18, 18. And we saw how Peter moved into denial, not just once, twice, but three times he denies ever having anything to do with Jesus. And as we saw last week, we might not deny Jesus with our mouth, but we deny him with our actions. You might not one man and say, oh, I don't believe in Jesus, or I'm not Christian or whatever, but by the way we choose to live sometimes, we are denying Christ. And scripture says, if you confess me before man, I will confess you before my Father. And that is a living out, rhema word. If you're confessing me with your life, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. So Peter denies Jesus verbally in this situation. You know, sometimes it's a bit tough, we can back out, you might be at work, you might want to say something, but we, we back out, we come under uh, pressure. Some people turn their backs and do a 180 degree turn. They turn away, jump ship, abandon their walk. Sometimes pride can do this, sin can do it, guilt can do it. And some people, when they muck up, rather than dealing with it and coming to the grace of God, they walk away. They say, well, I'm not good enough, I've mucked up, and they walk away. Or they're worried about what other people think of them. You know, I've mucked up. Now, I'm not advocating this by any means, but as an example, if we had a, a young uh, couple in church and uh, they got pregnant, you know, they would probably feel they couldn't come to church. Why? Because they've sinned and they've got pregnant, you know? And a lot of churches will just make a spectacle and an example of them for everybody else to say, right, oh, this is what you don't do. If you want to know how to not do something, that's how you don't do something. And you can have all that kind of thing. Now, at the end of the day, the difference between that couple or maybe another ten couples is she got pregnant, they didn't. Yep. 
They're probably doing the same thing, it's just this one got pregnant. That's all it is, and the pregnancy is not the sin. By the way, pregnancy is not a sin. Sex before marriage is a sin, pregnancy is not a sin, a baby is not a sin, okay? It's doing that stuff in the first place. Now, a lot of them would back off and run away and be put, do you know what? That is so unscriptural. It's not. We, we, you get alongside them and you teach them and say, well, it's sin what you've done, but this is the circumstances. Do you repent? Yes, you do. Wonderful. Right. Well, we need to help you. We need to discuss how we can be a blessing. What do you need? You know, and get alongside, build them up, and let them know that God's love doesn't change irrespective of them mm-hmm. or their behaviour. God's love doesn't change. Amen? Mm-hmm. But see, in, in a lot of churches, they, it's not like that. You know? And Jesus, I don't think, would push everybody away. He would rather discipline them, which means not punishment. We learned this. Discipline is not punishment. Discipline is to teach. So he would discipline them by teaching them the right way to do things. So when you say, I'm going to discipline my children, it doesn't mean you're beating them up. It means you're going to teach them. Amen? And a lot of people get confused. If Jesus died on the cross for my sin and was punished, why am I being punished? You're saying, there's no point punishing Jesus. Then if you're going to punish me, you've got to teach me. Amen? So some just turn away, and there's many, many Christians out there who are just walking without a closeness anymore. Others stay. They don't abandon shit, but they wallow in self-pity. They wallow in fear. They They wallow in get fearful of getting it wrong again, and stuff like that. So we're talking about the different reactions to sin. Some run away. Some get into self-pity. Imagine Peter who denied denied Christ three times. Imagine the shame. He must have felt, I'm I'm worthy of nothing. I am the lowest scum on the earth. I'm worse than Pilate. I denied my Lord three times, and yet I said publicly, I would never leave you. I would die for you if I had to. And then I deny him three times, and everyone knows it. He's, He's ready to pack his bags and go to... Majorca or Morocco or anywhere else with an M, you know? He's, he's out of there. You wouldn't want to. But yet, despite how he felt, he stayed. God, that's a, that is a man to stay and face the consequences. That's a man. That is love to stay and face the consequences. That's incredible. It's not easy. Now, the last group, those facing sin, are those who admit their sin, take responsibility for their failure or their mistake, repent and receive the forgiveness of God. They leave failure and sin behind them and they continue on their path. Amen? That is how you deal with sin. It's a bit like uh, children with Down syndrome. Okay, and you see children with Down syndrome when they do the running, and they're all running in a race to get to the end. But if a Down syndrome child falls down and overrides, hey, all the other children stop to us. Johnny fell over. Johnny fell over. Let's go help Johnny up. Johnny down, Johnny. And they help Johnny. Come, Johnny, let's run together. We're going to win. And that's what they do. But a normal runner, screw you, mate, I'm off. I'm going to get the prize. You're one person out of my way. You know? But see, the church should stop and pick up the wounded and say, right, in a plonker, let's carry on. Okay? Not leave them dying, bleeding out on the field. We pick them up. We teach them. We show them the love of God. Do they deserve it? No. Nor do you. And be careful how you look at about how people fall. You just boil and maybe never got caught. You just weaken another area. And you've got to remember, sin is sin. There's not different categories in heaven. Ricky gets there and goes, well, uh, Ricky sins, well, oh, oh, we got some big ones here, boys. Did you see that TikTok that the pastor showed you? I mean, that's sin in itself. 
you know, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and we could be worried that there's going to be a big video, you get into heaven, you get through the pearly gates, and then you're in cinema number one, <laughs> with an in cinema number one that's going to show the film of your life and your mistakes, as you go in cinema number one, all the people who can't stand you are in that <laughs> watching as well. They've all got their popcorn ready. They're like, get yeah, the load of this. And all that stuff in the private, in quiet, every single thought is projected onto the screen. And you say, oh, it's such joy to be in heaven. Yeah? It's not going to happen. Amen? The only thing that will be judged in heaven is your works. That will be judged. The intent of your heart. That will be judged. The sin won't be judged. Why? Because it was judged on the cross 2,000 years ago. It was dealt with, sorted out, finished. The only judgment will be for our works, which is the intent of our heart in serving the Lord. And then, isn't that good to know? I mean, who would you go to if it was like that? Who, you look round the room and who would you go to? Oh, that, one of mine would be Tony. I'm sorry, I've got a Tony. Next police officer, I want to know what you've been up to. Oh. Another one, another one would be Steve. Sorry, Steve. <laughs> You're one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. You absolutely are. I want to know what it's like to find him. Oh, I just want to know. Yeah, I want to know. I don't know, maybe he's got... Maybe he's got a secret life and he says to everyone he's a landscape gardener but really those little plants that he grows I don't know it's just a suggestion that's all I'm saying but I wonder who no let's stop stop behaving who would come to mind yeah everybody I'd be, like, I'd be selling tickets mate you know what I'm like I don't care I'd be saying, yeah, come in, tickets, do you want popcorn with that, drink with that, after you go in there, yeah. uh, and I'll tell you what, you will be entertained. <laughs> it's probably an 18, though. <laughs> okay, we'll warn you, it's probably an 18. <laughs> so Peter keeps going despite the failures, despite the weaknesses, despite the let that he keeps going. And so often we give up. We give in, we're disappointed, or we're embarrassed and we're ashamed. Now there's nothing wrong with having the feelings of giving up. Because we're human. And so that's a normal emotion. I want to give up, I can't take this anymore. I don't know how to deal with it, I've had enough. And that's how we feel, and David says it many times in the Psalms, how he feels that he's just giving up, I've had enough. But the wonderful thing for the Christian it, you just can't. You just find that you can't. You want to, and then you get frustrated that you can't. You're like, ah, I want to, I want to give up. I want to walk away. I've been with Ricky, Tony, Yomi, Mara, in years gone by, in tears, saying to them, I want to give up. I don't want to carry on. Why should I carry on? It's not a sin if I give up. And they just smiled and humoured me and loved me through. You know. Mark 16 tells us, Mark 16 verse 6 tells us that three women went to the tomb of Jesus three days after the crucifixion to find it empty. There was an angel there that said to them, Do not be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen, he is not here. See the place where they lay him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. Therefore, you will see him just as he told you. Isn't it amazing? Now, at this point, Peter has not seen Jesus other than the death. So he's, he's denied Jesus on the cross uh, in the courtrooms and in the market square. He's denied him three times. Okay. Then Jesus is taken to the cross and dies. Okay. Peter's had nothing to do with him. The message is sent, he's going ahead of you, he's risen, see the place where he's laying, go and tell his disciples and Peter. What was Peter thinking? Why me? He knows 
himself denied him. He knows I bled him. That, that would be me. I'd be petrified. But Jesus is different. Jesus was saying, listen, tell the disciples, but make sure Peter knows. Peter needs to know more than any of the others. Peter needs to know that I am alive. And he singles out Peter. In spite of his denial of Christ, Jesus did not disown Peter. Jesus has never disowned anyone. Okay? Jesus doesn't disown people. We disown people sometimes and we cut people out of their lives and there's no way for them to come back in or someone's cut you out of their life. But Jesus never disowns you. Once he owns you, it's forever. And he doesn't disown Peter based upon his weaknesses. He still has the same plan for Peter that he had when he said, upon this rock I will build my church. And then he still had the same plan after Peter's sin. Peter's sin did not disqualify him for the future purposes that God had for him. And sometimes we can feel disqualified and think, well, I've blown what God might have had for me because of my behaviour. You know what? The devil is a liar. Rub yourself down, clean yourself down, and get marching again. And march into what God has for you. Yeah. Yeah. Apathy will make you stay down. Remember the prophetic words over your life. And say, well, it's either a load of rubbish that someone spoke to me out of emotion, or it's the prophetic word of God. And you need to discern from the two, what is it? I've had some right old waffle spoken over me, I tell you. Absolute mumbo jumbo voodoo rubbish. What people have prophesied over me, I tell you. If the prophecies come true, what have been prophesied over me, I should be six foot nine, two inch giant or something. You know what I mean? It's just twaddle, it's just rubbish. You know? Other stuff prophesied over me, bang on. Absolutely, I know that's the word of God. This time next year, you're going to be a millionaire. Dell boys. That's all they've done. They've just watched an episode of Only Balls and Horses. Thought I'd use that spot. Ricky, I'll fill it here this time next year, my brother. You know? Prophecy is so taken out of context. The prophetic in the early church was rarely over the singular, it was over the body. Yeah. It was over the body, not the singular, right Luke? Yeah. And now we're so, oh if I can only go to this meeting, I've done it. I've gone to the meetings, I've stood on the front row, thought, and the prophets come in, or the big speaker, oh let it be me, let it be me, like the lot of it, it's you. No, you want them to prophesy over you. Give me a word from God. Give me a prophecy. And off they go. And they say, no, not that one. Give me another prophecy. You know, it's amazing. There's people on Facebook and social media contact me to your personal prophecy. That's witchcraft. That's witchcraft. I'm telling you, it's demonic. It's witchcraft. Don't contact anyone for your personal prophecy of the month, the day, or the hour. Witchcraft. Pollution. That's what that is. The greatest revelation you'll probably get from the Lord is through the Word. In reality. Anyway, moving on. Uh, so when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, mother of, G mother of James, and the others with them, who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. The slightest hope that Jesus is risen. Peter can't help himself. He just can't help himself. He's off like a rat out of an aqueduct. He's gone. Straight to the tomb. If there's any chance my Saviour's alive, 
If there's any chance that this possible resurrection has happened, and bang, he's gone. He's the first one who runs to the tomb. He got to the tomb, bending over and saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Peter did not merely rely on rumours and hearsay, he wanted to find out for himself. He wanted to understand what had happened. He was eager to know the truth. Eager to know the truth. Do not rely on rumours. Rumours are dangerous. Rumours are gossip. Get the truth. Okay? Have the guts to ask for the truth and have the guts to accept the truth. You know? Get the truth. Luke 24, 34 says that they come together and say, Is it true? The Lord has arisen and has appeared to Simon Peter. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. Says, but what I receive, I pass on to you, as of first importance, that Christ died for our sin according to Scripture, and that he was buried and raised on the third day according to Scripture, not Facebook, not YouTube, according to Scripture. And that was raised on the third day, according to scripture, and that he had appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. Wow. See, Peter needed, needed the approval and building up of Jesus. Jesus appears to Peter on his own and shows that he cares for him, that everything was okay between them. Peter would probably feel him unworthy for denying Christ. Peter repented and Jesus forgave him and used him to build the church. Amen? Now we would say Peter was the least qualified and the most unlikely one that you would follow out of the disciples. He's not very stable. He's a bit of a flesh bag. He's, he's you know, very much about himself, really. And on top of all of that, the very movement that Jesus is building, Peter denies that he even knew Christ. Well, you're not going to follow him, are you? you there's no way. But God chose Peter before Peter was even born. God knew that he was going to use Peter. And God knows the plans that he has for you. The plans for your life, God knew before you were born. He's not running behind you with a pen and paper, changing them according to your actions. You know? Having to make it up as he goes along. God foreknew. Hallelujah. Jesus appeared to Peter and loved him. John 21. John 21. So they, they, we saw last week that Peter and John had recognised Jesus on the beach and Peter had took his garment, wrapped it round himself, jumped into the water, again he's run to the tomb and now he was running to the beach to see Jesus. Don't you, don't you love his love for Jesus? He might be a bit of an idiot, but he did not love him. It's a bit like when your children are young and they want to do something to bless you and they maybe make you breakfast in bed. <laughs> but, but something happens between the kitchen, the tray, and the bedroom. Because downstairs, when they've made it on the tray, they've done some little cornflakes, put them in a bowl, they've done a little orange juice in a glass, they've put some toast on there as well, a little bit of fruit maybe. But and that journey between the kitchen and the bedroom, by the time they get to the bedroom, it's just one big mess of artwork. There's cornflakes all over the toast, the toast has got fruit on it, the orange juice has spilt over and turned the milk into oil, and it's all just a mess. It's a mess. It's a lovable mess. Because they tried, and that love me. And that love, look what they did for me. And you appreciate the fact that they tried. 
is when they come home and they've done a picture at school mm. and they, the, the, worst, the worst line is, what is it? They just tell you, they expect you to know and they bring the picture in, they give it to you, look mummy, daddy, look what I do at school. What is it? I do it for you, what is it? And you're like, even God don't know what that is. So, oh, so, I mean, what the heck is that? And you're like, oh, it's uh, ah, go on, Leah. Leah, it's uh, is, is it uh, an anim? Is it an anim? And you see the colour draining on their face because they realise that you don't know what it is. Is it is it an animal? And you, you start trying. Is it a dog? Is it a cat? Cat? A monkey? Cat? Uh, is it a diamond? No, no. It's a house. Oh, it's a house. You know. And what they've done is a mess. It's rubbish. Nobody knows what that is. A genius could not work that out, but they did it. And it's their heart and it's their intention and it's important to them what they did. Because it, yes, it's coming from a heart of purity. And that's Peter. Peter often offers the Lord a bit of a mess, really. But that mess in the hands of the Lord, that picture in the hands of of a painter becomes a Picasso. That bread and two fish is just five loaves and two fish, but put in the hands of Jesus, it feeds 5,000 people. Kept in the boy's hands, it's just, it's, all it is is five loaves of bread and a couple of fish, but put in the hands of the Saviour. Wow, what do we need to give to God? Lives, our relationships, our businesses, uh, our education, what, what is it? Our desires, and we really need to give them to him. Just let him, let him have them. Put up the white flag of surrender. You know, in the olden days when there was a war and battles and everything, the way to surrender was the white flag. You'd wave the white flag. You surrender. It meant the enemy knew you surrendered and weren't going to fight anymore. And sometimes we just need to have a fully surrendered life to the Lord. Fully surrendered. And sometimes we need to catalogue it. We need to just go through our life and say, what part of my life is not fully surrendered? What needs to die, really? What do I really need to surrender in my personality? Is it my insecurity? Is it my finances? Is it fear of the future? Is it my, my children? Where do I just need to say, do you know what? I'm trying to make this work. I just need to surrender. Somebody said to me, a lovely person, they were a doctor, a surgeon, and they were crying at the end of the service after I preached, and it wasn't because the preaching was bad, God was just moving. And they were crying and crying, and they came to me and said, Pastor, what do I need to do? And looking for some great wisdom, pearl, insight to give them direction. What do I need to do? Very intelligent person, a surgeon. What do I need to do? I said, oh, it's easy. You just need to die. You just need to die. You're too big. It's all about you and your personality and your opinion and everything else. And you're not a whirlwind of fire of life. You just need to die. Sometime later, they, they saw me just to confirm their death. They had died. They had changed. Wonderful. So, so this is Peter's journey. And, and this is the point I really want us to get now this morning. And Peter... And, and struggled to love the church. He struggled to love the other disciples. His love for Jesus was unquestionable. You can see it. Even though he denied Jesus, that was his humanity, he still loved Jesus. He really loved him. But in amongst his humanity, he makes all these mistakes. His personality comes out. He says things he shouldn't. He does things he shouldn't. But he really loves Jesus. He loves Jesus. But Jesus has said, look, upon this rock I will build my church. Upon Peter's revelation will be the groundwork. I'll give to you, remember, the keys of heaven and earth. What you bind in heaven, you bind on earth. Remember, we learned that that means carrying the mantle of authority for the new church to 
to move forward. Things were going to be different and they were going to set a new mantle. So John 21, verse 15. John 21 and verse 15. All this has taken place and they're, they're on the beach and I kind of think Jesus, the, the disciples were having their barbecue morning fry up and uh, Jesus kind of just grabs Peter. This is in my mind. He just grabs Peter and puts his arm on his shoulder and says, come on, let's have a chat. And people could be worried about me like that if I come up and put my arm on your shoulder and say, Ricky, we need to chat. He goes, oh, what have I done? Right, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> it's not that bad, honestly, it's not. But Peter, Jesus comes along and he knows where Peter's weak and he knows he's got to get him strong. And he says, Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said, be my lamb. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt. Okay? He's got emotion, he's human. Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Peter had denied Christ publicly three times. And now Jesus was teaching Peter three times how to love him. Three times Jesus tells Peter he wants him to feed his sheep. See, the problem is, Peter was trying to love Jesus in a way that Jesus didn't need him to love him. And you get the same in relationships, friendships, you know? Unless you're really intimate with somebody, you won't necessarily know the best way to express love to someone, to a person. And Peter was just consumed with loving Jesus. That was enough. But Jesus had to get Peter to love the church on the same level that Peter loved Jesus. Because at this point, Peter doesn't love the church on the same level that he loves Jesus. He loved Jesus with all of his heart. But when it comes to the disciples, he was just trying to outdo them and look better all the time, in reality. And, and Jesus has prophesied, upon this rock, this revelation, this man, I will build my church. The only problem is, this man does not love the church. And I need him to see that if, if he truly loves me, He's got to love what I love. And I've laid my life down for the church. Okay? So he's got to get Peter's eyes onto the church and onto the other disciples and fulfilling the role that he would have him fulfill. Peter shows his affection time and time again for Jesus. He was commended for showing his love. But Jesus was saying, if you truly love me, this is what you need to do. Now, in my and Mara's relationship, I can express my love to her because I know how she likes to be loved. I know what flicks her switch in that sense. I know how she likes to be loved. Don't wake her up in the morning. Because she does a lot of night work. And she, she likes to sleep. Don't hit her when she's snoring. <laughs> Just let her turn off. Just let it go. Just pretend you're on a train. And you go back to sleep. I'll get back to sleep again. No. Uh, do her breakfast in bed. Do her breakfast in bed this week. So did you. Four of them are good. But learn to 
doesn't love people the way they want to be loved. Um, but when we first got together, I wanted to love her differently because I'm a bit of a romantic. So I want my way of loving her is book a restaurant, nice meal, come home, nice bottle of wine, chockies and munchies and all that, watch a film together, early night, and the more. Okay? So that, that to, but to her, she's not wired that way. For me to express my love to her, it would be, she'd be thinking, oh, if only I'd do the washing up. If only I'd empty the bin. If only I'd rinse the bath out. I don't expect the toilet seat to go down. It's never going to happen. <laughs> there are limits to a man's capability. Okay? Yeah. But that is an expression of love. And often we're trying to love people in a way that they don't, we want to love them the way we want to love them. If you want to love Yomi like that, and you've got, to keep, you've got to keep up to date with the love language as well, because it changes. If you want to love Yomi, three years ago, buy her a nice top, which is mustard in colour. If you want to love Yomi today, get her plants for the garden. <laughs> Just don't buy them from Steve, they might be illegal. No, <laughs> no I'm joking. On the camera, that's a joke. But you've got to be, you've got to keep up with the relationship because people change, you know, people change, and so it's working out. And and so Jesus has got Peter who's fixated on him, but Peter has got to learn to love the disciples, and that's why Jesus goes through this whole rendition: Do you love me more than these? Because he wants him to love them. Yes, Lord, you know I do. Well, then feed my lambs. If you claim, Peter, that you love me, I want you, Peter, to do something for them. That's what Jesus is saying. If, Peter, you claim you love me, then I want you, Peter, to feed my lambs. You've got to do something for them. See, we, we're not like that as humans. We just want to put that down. So, all right then, Lord, if I want to love you, the best way I can express my love for you is loving them. I can't just love you then. No, Peter, you can't just love me. It doesn't work like that. Feed my land. Simon, son of John, do you love me? I said, Lord, you know that I love you. Excellent. Then take care of my sheep. You've got to feed the land and take care of my sheep. Yeah, but Lord, I just want to be mushy, mushy, love you. I'm not so keen on the sheep. Sheep are a bit smelly. Sheep have got tits. Sheep have got lice. Sheep are pain in the back. They're mental. I mean, what sort of a noise is that? This is dog bark. What, what? You can understand that. What, what? Cat. Right, catch it. Meow. It's all at the back of the throat. She's very posh. Meow. Meow. You know, a, a bird whistles. You know, a, a cow, moo! You've got this decent. What's the shit then? Ah! <laughs> I mean, it's like it's choking on its own phlegm. There's something wrong with it. Of all the animals God could have chosen for humanity to be like, we're like sheep. <laughs> we were just like, ah! Ah! Oh, that's it. Ah! <laughs> you know? It's crazy. And it's just like, of all of them, yes, them sheep, smelly, naughty sheep, keep wandering off. They were pain in the backside. That's it. If you love me, you've got to love them. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt. Peter's getting fed up. He said, I've had enough of this. He may have been all knowing. He can't even remember two minutes ago. I've just told him twice that I love him. And all he wants me to do is be a farmer. And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He's there frustrated. He said, Lord, you know all things. He said, okay, Lord, let's have the conversation. You know everything. And it's almost like he's reminded or happened to remind the Lord that he knows everything. And the third time he said, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You 
know that I love you. It's funny, when you're insecure in a relationship, you look at your partner or wife or whatever, do you love me? We've been together 30 years, you have to ask. Love you, I'll put up with you, don't I? You know, some people are like that. They think loving is putting up with someone. I put up with you for 30 years. But the third time, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep, Peter. If you love me, if you really love me, you need to feed my sheep. You need to look after the land. You need to feed the sheep. Feed the land. And it's the same today. Many of us can say, well, me and God, we're all right. We're, but it's just the rest. I've said it myself. I'm all right. I love God. I don't have a problem with God. It's just his people aren't very nice. You know? And let me warn you now, if you're thinking of becoming a Christian, right? If you're thinking of becoming a Christian, you have not yet met the most horrible people in life. Because they're probably going to be Christians. Okay? Yeah, you, you can be ripped off by Christians, lied to, deceived, everything, and they can shatter your faith, you know? So I'm putting you ahead of the game, okay? So that you don't walk away when it happens. You can look back to past Matthew said that. that it will, why? Because it's human. It's human. Christians. And we expect more from Christians. Well, they don't, I don't expect it from them because they're not Christians. But they were Christians, so I expect more. Yeah, but both groups are still human and have sin in their lives. That's the problem, you know? That's the problem. So this journey that Peter's on crescendos with Jesus, trying to get Peter to understand, Peter, you cannot love me if you don't really love my sheep. Matthew 22, and, and he should have learned this already, in Matthew 22, verse 36. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. For all the prophets all the law and all the prophets hang on these two, not one, these two commandments. Now I love Jesus because the religious world were trying to trap him. They were trying to trick Jesus over and outsmart him. And instead he turns it upside down and he tricks them over. Okay? Now as you read the text it says, Teacher, which of the greatest commandments of the law, which is the greatest one, they have an expectation for one answer, which is the greatest one, okay? They were expecting one answer, but Jesus gives them two answers. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul, so on, and so and this is the first, and the second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. And he chucks the second in, and he doesn't put it any lower than the first. He puts it alongside and he says that all of the prophets, all of the Lord, Lord, hangs on this. You've got to get this. Because they weren't loving justly. They were loving injustly. Okay? So he says, look, there's an equality that you need to move into. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all that you are. And love your neighbour as yourself. Who is your neighbour? Your neighbour is the people in your life, your sphere of life. Work colleagues, people next door, uh, family, whatever. And there's not, a, there's not a clause that says only if they love you. Mm. It's very easy to love people who love you. It's hard to love people who don't love you. That's tough. That's tough. To love those who don't love you, why should I even bother? They don't love me, they don't care about me. But that's what the scripture says, you've got to love them. And not just that, you've got to love them as yourself. Not that much, surely. I was going to eat the whole pie for me. Well, love them enough to give them my pie instead of me. Yeah, 
This is the depth of love of revelation that Peter had to get. Why? Because Peter eventually was going to lay his life down and be crucified for the church. He wasn't crucified for Jesus. He was crucified for the church. But he was hung upside down on a cross because he did not feel worthy to be crucified the same way as his Lord. So he was hung upside down on a cross. What a journey. What a man he became. I tell you the truth, Jesus talking to Peter, I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand and somebody else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. See, that's part of the Christian walk, self-denial. To lead you where you do not want to go. He was talking about the kind of death that Peter would have. Wow. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This is the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper. And they said, Lord, who is going to betray you? This was John. When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is it to you? You must follow me. In other words, keep your nose out of other people's business. What God's doing in Carl's life has got nothing to do with some people. That's Carl and God. What, what God had called and anointed Carl for is between Carl and God. And sometimes we stick our noses in and we want to express our opinions and say, well, I think this, or I feel that, or I feel the other. Yeah, but it's between Carl and God. You know? And we see that on this journey, from this reed, he became a rock. And the early church was back upon this revelation, upon this great, great man who got it wrong, who shouldn't have been called, who blew it, who denied Jesus three times, but the great revelation was on the beach when he said, if you love me, then you've got to love these people. If you do not love these people, by default, you do not love me. By default. I was with a, a Christian guy a couple of years back trying to mentor him, and I'm talking to him about the church, he's in love with Jesus. Jesus is absolutely fantastic, and he's in love with Jesus. Uh, he said, you know what, I don't love Christians. I don't love people at church. I don't love them. I can confess it. I can see they love each other, and they love the church, and this, that, and that, but I don't. And I looked at him, I said, man, I lied. I said, you are dangerous ground. I said, you don't know how dangerous that ground is. Oh, but I love the Lord. No, 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 no. You see, you don't. You don't. Because you don't value what the Lord values. Think you love the Lord, but you're a Peter. You're a very young, naive Peter. And you need to learn to love the church. Yeah, but uh, I think this as well. You can think whatever you want, I'm just giving you my opinion. So it's funny how people become unteachable when you go across something they don't like. And honestly, I fear for people in that situation. Me and Mama were in America a couple of years ago, and we were with a great man of God and his wife, and they had done stuff all over the world. I mean, absolutely incredible stuff. And they're talking to me about an English pastor and his wife who stayed with them, and they said to us, do you know what, that man, who anyone would say is a great man of God, his wife, lovely woman, uh, they said, do you know what, they stayed with us, and all they did was complain about the very people they pastored. All they did, the whole time. He said, they could not and their congregation absolutely loathed them. He said, and me and my wife, his wife, Chrissy, said, we sat and we listened to them and thought, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? And that congregation, I'm telling you, I know them, they looked after their pastors, absolutely loved them, looked after them, 
Amazing, that's amazing, amazing love. They were shown, and yet they did not love. Incredible, incredible. But the only reason I'm a pastor is because I love you. The only reason, there are many times I've said to Mama, I don't want to be a pastor. Why? Because you're hard work. I don't want to be a pastor. I want to be a travelling evangelist. Sweep in, pray, sweep out. No problems, haven't got to deal with relationships. Easy. Take the top ten sermons, travel the world, leave all the problems to the pastor to sort out. You know, stand on somebody else's say It's awful when you get a prophet come in and they start prophesying rubbish. And they always pick people that not in a month of Sundays, you know, it's just wrong. You know? And then they clear up and they leave you with all these people. You know? She's, she's, you know, 65, built like the back of a bus, looks like the back of a bus, been run over four times. You prophesy I'm going to marry some 20 year old, and she's sold on it. She's like, yes! It happens! And then they clear off and leave you, you know? Or they come up with some weird theology. You've spent six months teaching the church basic theology, and they come in and say, no, you, you muck up, mate, you'll go down, you are, sort yourself out. And then they go. <laughs> right, I'll be preaching that next week again. But it, it really does come down. And that's where we have to challenge ourselves. Do we love his people as we love him? That's the real challenge. That's maturity is exercised in that. Tough, not easy. Not easy. Some people are easy to love. Me, piece of cake. You know? Easy peasy. No, not really. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we just thank you for your word, Lord. I thank you for that journey Peter was on. We can so often see ourselves in it, Lord. And yet the pinnacle of that journey was that, that breakfast on the beach. Do you love me? But Lord, you ask the same question of this congregation. Do we love you? Well, the evidence, the answer doesn't come from our mouth. It comes from our love for one another. Lord, the word says, the world would know you through our love for one another. The world would know Jesus Christ. The greatest evangelistic tool the world will ever know is our love for one another. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, Lord God, for healing each one who have been hurt or let down or abused in church and church relationships, Lord. I pray that you would heal them, Lord God, so that they can genuinely love people without keeping their reserves. You know, only going so far but no farther. I pray, Lord, that you would we would truly be a church of covenant relationships, absolutely covenanted to one another, committed to one another. We are ELC, Effective Life Church. We're an effective, loving church, Lord God. That's, Lord, our desire is to be who you desire us to be. Nothing more, nothing less, Lord. Some people think church membership is just about saying I affiliate or I agree with this particular group. Church membership is a covenant of heart. Love your people, Lord. So Father, I pray that you will equip us more and more and that the world will be baffled. Wow, do you love these people so much? They're not even kin. They're not even your family. And yet you sacrifice and you give so much and you, you, you just care for them. What is that? Oh Lord, let that be our portion. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Um, I've got two, two things to say. The first one is relating um, what Pastor Matthew was uh, preaching earlier um, about when Peter denied Jesus and then, um, you know, um, he felt really bad about it. And he was using a lot of the scriptures. But as I was sitting there, God reminded me of a scripture that he used some time ago. And that is very, very powerful. So if you want to turn to Luke chapter 22, verse 31. 
And in verse 31, he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift, to sift each of you like wheat. But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Okay, and that's when Peter said, Lord, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you and even to die with you. And then uh, Jesus tells him that before the rooster crows uh, three times, he would, uh, he would, you would deny him. Now, verse 31 and 32 is very, very important because Jesus did not pray that Peter would not fail. He didn't pray that. Right? It was necessary for Peter to fail. Okay? But he had prayed that his faith would remain strong and he would return to Jesus and he would repent and after that he would do what Jesus had said that he would do, which was to build a church. Okay? So I want to encourage you all, right? That uh, many times we mess up and we think that we've um, you know, we've really hurt Jesus and so forth. But you have to remember that Jesus is praying for you. He's praying for you to repent and to turn back to him and to continue in faith to do what he has called you to do. Okay? Okay? So that I wanted to really encourage you all that sometimes, you know, we, we even we are praying for other people as well that they wouldn't do certain things and they still go and do it and they think, God, I've been praying. You know, sometimes maybe it's the only way that God is going to get their attention and get them to the right road. And sometimes it's good to fail. Okay?